BBOR Black Box Online Radio coming to you from West Virginia. Black Box Ned 88 on Instagram for the bonus podcast. And welcome to BBOR, the home of True Crime Talk Radio and your premier destination for unsolved mysteries, criminal psychology, and exploring the dark side of cyberspace. My name is Ned DeHaan, and I am your host as well as the creator of Astro Psych 400 here on YouTube, and regular contributor to the Zodiac Killer channel. And a great way to support these shows is just by listening to some more content. But you can also go over to Amazon.com and have a look at the book Killer on a White Horse, written by me, Ned Dahan. It is a novel, murder mystery, inspired by the Zodiac Manson connection, but it is indeed fictional. However, who doesn't love a good mystery? And there is always the Teespring page. Feel free to check out some of the merchandise. And remember, being weird is not a crime. Let the show begin. Okay, hello everybody. Today is Wednesday, and on Wednesdays this year I've been doing a regular segment about Jack the Ripper, perhaps the world's most famous unsolved murder mystery. And I would like to give a shout-out to Mystery Junkie, who sent this in actually on the Zodiac Monday episode. Hey, on your Jack the Ripper series, I think Francis Tumblety is a worthy... Is worth a of an episode. Wow, excuse me, I can't read too well today. Let's see how this goes. He's a pretty compelling suspect, and even if he wasn't Jack the Ripper, he lives such a crazy life, the episode would write itself. And uh, Mystery Junkie also sent something in here saying, Francis Tumblety has been my favorite suspect. So, I would like to make the announcement that I'm trying to get to more of your requested topics not only for Jack the Ripper and the Zodiac Killer, but also for the Anything Goes Friday segment. And if there are ever any more bonus episodes that come out on the weekends, I want to respond to your request. So as you see, this is one that was suggested by one of the listeners. If you have any ideas for a future episode of Black Box Online Radio, you can put your idea in the comments section down below. And you can always hit the like button, subscribe. Follow along on social media, on Instagram, Facebook, and I'm going to be sharing the Twitter page for the show soon. And if you would like to support all of these efforts, you can go over to buymeacoffee.com. Buymeacoffee.com slash blackboxned88. There's a link to that in the description box. And if you would like to make a donation or contribution to help support the show using that website, you will get a shout out on Zodiac Monday. And everything is greatly appreciated. But I would like to talk about Francis Tumblety as a Jack the Ripper suspect. Jack the Ripper was a serial killer who operated in 1888 in England. And Mystery Junkie said that the episode would write itself. And whew, absolutely, that could not be more true. And I want to be very clear about something. Most of the time, when we're talking about serial killers on this channel, it's not a humorous subject. I and mean, some people even ask me, Ned, why are you being so serious all the time? Well, I mean, we're talking about murder mysteries. I mean, real people died. They lost their lives when they shouldn't have. But with the story of Francis Tumblety, there is going to be a little bit of humor that is going to be seeping in because I have to give full credit to Mystery Junkie. Yeah, this episode is going to write itself. And the, I'm going to share this with you guys exactly the way that I learned it. And I'm just going to go through the sources exactly as I read them. And I had heard of Francis Tumblety as a suspect. I mean, I follow the websites like jacktheripper.com.org uh, and uh, Jack the Ripper Tour as well. And they put out polls from time to time. Who do you think Jack the Ripper was? And Francis Tumblety is actually on the higher, higher end of the voting spectrum. I mean, more people vote for him in terms of likelihood of being Jack the Ripper than some of the other suspects that I've covered on this Wednesday show. But... I put him into Google, and I just pulled up his Wikipedia, and he, his occupation was listed as medical quack. And I was like, excuse me, what? Am I reading this right? Yeah, his occupation was listed as medical quack. Let's just have a direct read. Francis Tumblety was born in 1833, and he died on May 28th of 1903. He was an Irish-born American medical quack. It says it in multiple places who earned a small fortune posing as an Indian herb doctor throughout the United States and Canada. He was an eccentric self-promoter and often in trouble with the law. He has been put forward as a suspect for the notorious and unsolved Jack the Ripper murder spree in Whitechapel in London. Immediately, I was thinking, yep, yeah, there's going to be a big story here. 
According to the 1850 United States Census, Tumblety was born in Ireland. His parents were named James and Margaret, although their name was spelled Tumulty, T-U-M-U-E-L-T-Y, so spelled on their tombstone. Along with his ten brothers and sisters, he immigrated to Rochester, New York, a few years after his birth. By the age of 17, he was selling books which were possibly pornographic along the Erie Canal. And again, so many times I have to do double takes. I was like, wait, w w what on earth is going on? Indian herb doctor, medical quack, selling porn, 15 miles on the Erie Canal. I'm like, how... How is all of this just coming together? I mean, he left home around 17 and did not return for 10 years. He was briefly employed as a cleaner at a hospital in Rochester. Now, I have to throw in an interjection that is both relevant and off-topic at the same time. I am really quite surprised about how many of these Jack the Ripper suspects have a connection to America or they lived in America. And one point that... I am forced to admit in my own naivete is that in 1888, I mean, the inter, the interchange between the United States and England, it was just so much bigger than I thought. And the way that people are communicating and the way that the news is being shared between the United States and England, I mean, it is very, very well connected. And I was, I was uh, first looking into this because of a different case, the story of the Midnight Assassin, another uh, serial killer who operated a little bit before, um, before Jack the Ripper in 1884 and 1885 in the United States. And there was this theory being formulated that the Midnight Assassin and Jack the Ripper could have been the same person. And the people in the United States are just completely up to date on what's going on with the Ripper killings and the news is spreading throughout the country. James Maybrick actually is a suspect for being both Jack the Ripper and the Midnight Assassin, but another example of a serial killer and um, Jack the Ripper suspect who was in America for an extended period of time was Thomas Neal Cream, Dr. Cream, yes, the uh, Lambeth Poisoner, and he was also in Canada for a large uh, portion of his life, but he spent 10 years in prison in Chicago, Illinois, actually, in Joliet Prison, and Robert Graysmith, of all people, author of the book Zodiac, also has a suspect who, um, I believe he starts in Scotland and then goes to England, and I guess he's Jack the Ripper there, and then moves to San Francisco, but I haven't, as you see, I haven't read that book yet. I've, I've just um, read, you know, like some of uh, Graysmith's comments about Jack the Ripper. That would be one book that I would like to read in the future, though. It's called The Bell Tower. But, but to uh, talk about Francis Tumblety, another person who has a um, a connection to America, Tumblety set himself up in business. Initially in Detroit, he claimed to be a great physician, but was commonly perceived as a quack. He sold patent medicines such as Tumblety's Pimple Destroyer. <laughs> And Dr. Morse's Indian root pills. <laughs> I, I don't This guy was probably a terrible person in his daily life, but something about that just seems cool. And he gained a reputation for his eccentric, ostentatious clothes, which were frequently of military nature. Now, this is something that I've talked about on Black Box Online Radio before that is connected to the city of Detroit, but for a different person who came years later, and his name was Wallace Fard. He went on to be known as Wallace Fard Muhammad, and he founded the Nation of Islam, and he did almost the same thing in Detroit. He's selling these garments to people and pretending to be from the land of Mecca and saying that these are traditional African clothes, even though Mecca isn't in Africa. I, I, don't, I don't mean to take the piss too much out of him because there are reasons why he said all that. But the whole point is that, I mean, what's, what's, what is it about Detroit where they're just, um, well, I know why. It's because there is this uh, migration of people from the south to the north and then they're exploring new territory and some people are just trying to make it in a tough world and they're going to turn to these things like Tumblety's Pimple Destroyer, I guess, to gain self-confidence. According to Tumblety, by 1857, he was practicing medicine in Canada, a lot like Dr. Cream, before being moved to New York and then to Washington, D.C. He claimed to have been introduced to Abraham Lincoln. Tumblety's medicinal approach was based on herbal remedies over mineral poisons such as mercury or surgical techniques. Well, I don't give you, um, I'm not going to give you any hatred there, brother. I mean, mercury can be poisonous. He was connected to the death of one of his patients in Boston, but escaped prosecution. Almost identical to the episode that I did on Dr. Thomas Neal Cream. And 
rather similar to um, the story of Etienne Deschamps, who is um, the subject of uh, what hap- the episode on this channel, What Happened to Juliet Deitch. Another doctor in Louisiana got in trouble to that, except he was convicted. In 1858, he returned to Rochester, apparently a rich man, making an ostentatious display of his wealth and new social standing and claiming that it had been achieved through patenting his medical cures. Federal tax records show that he was in Maryland in 1863, but he he soon moved to St. Louis, living on 50 Olive Street. On May 5th of 1865, he was arrested in St. Louis and taken to Washington on orders of the Secretary of War for alleged complicity in the assassination of Abraham Lincoln. And that is something that just truly, truly shocked me, that, okay, not only is this guy a Jack the Ripper suspect, but also the assassination of President Lincoln— you know, it just goes into the category of what will they think of next? I mean, I mean, I'm, no, and I don't mean to fault anyone. It's just, it seems like a genuinely wild story. I don't think that people are making that part up. I mean, th- those are just the facts. He's a Jack the Ripper suspect, and he has a connection to the, pre- the assassination of President Lincoln. I mean, sometimes the truth can be stranger than fiction. Tumblety visited Europe several times, including Ireland, Scotland, England, Germany, and France. He claimed to have been introduced to Charles Dickens and King William of Germany, and to have been uh, to have provided the treatment to Louis Napoleon, for which he was awarded the Legion of Honor. And yeah, okay, a little bit of a wild storytelling there, but so professional police officers and amateur researchers Stuart Evans and Paul Ganey detailed their evidence in their 1996 book Jack the Ripper First American Serial Killer and they stated that Tumblety was a temporarily a resident in a boarding house in Whitechapel during the brief period of, mur- of the murder rampage of Jack the Ripper and pieced together a case that he may be the culprit okay some points that we need to genuinely talk about involving Jack the Ripper this guy does not seem like he's a real doctor, but he's posing as a doctor. And he, would he have had the anatomical knowledge to have committed these crimes? I'm saying absolutely yes. Okay, not absolutely. I think most likely yes. He seems like someone who would have definitely read up on medicine to the point where he – I mean he's p- trying to pass himself off as some type of medicinal con man or – yeah, let's just say that medicinal con man. Therefore, when he is promoting these types of um, quack cures, I think that he would have been a very convincing person who would have learned all about the human body. And this is very relevant to the Jack the Ripper case because the crimes were not just committed by somebody like the Zodiac who would sneak up, commit the murder, and run away. Jack the Ripper spent an enormous amount of time with the bodies, mutilating the women, cutting their organs out, and showed that he understood where the organs were in the human body, and these weren't senseless mutilations. They, that some of them, some of them seem to have come from somebody who had the knowledge at least to extract a human kidney to the point or to cut out a human kidney. But, um, I mean, if you would like to dispute any of that, you can put your ideas in the comment section down below. But also, one thing that is um, different between um, Francis Tumblety and some of the other Jack the Ripper suspects is that he actually is suspected in the contemporary times a lot of the people that I've talked about here on this uh, segment for Ripper Wednesday are only thought of years later, decades later. It's like, well, they weren't really a suspect until the 1970s, or sometimes with suspects like Charles Lechmere, he isn't even really given strong consideration until more than 100 years after Jack the Ripper took place in 1888. Maybe somebody suspected him at some point, but to be involved in these strong types of discussions, not really until 100 years after the crimes, the Metropolitan Police arrested Tumblety on November 7th of 1888 on unrelated charges of gross indecency, apparently for having been caught in a homosexual encounter which was illegal at the time. Whilst awaiting trial on this charge of 300 pounds, um, that was the bail, 300 pounds, and knowing that Scotland Yard was increasingly interested in him with regard to the recent murder spree in Whitechapel, he fled England for France. On November 20th, he used the false name Frank Townsend, and on November 24th of 1888, he returned to the United States. Already notorious in the United States for his self-promotion and previous brushes with the law, Tumblety's arrest in London was reported in the New York Times as being connected to the Jack the Ripper murders. Do you see what I mean when I was talking about how he was thought to have been, or do you see what I mean when I said that there's just this interconnection and he's doing one thing in England and they're reporting on it in the United States of America. There is strong interconnection between the countries. And I know they don't have things like 
radios or they don't have things like perhaps on the internet and they're not even sharing communications though as the way that we can do it today they don't have things like whatsapp and so on and making phone calls over skype but everything was extremely up to date uh, to the point where they're able to keep track of the news they are able to know about suspects and their movements so, I mean, some of you guys might be thinking, well, yeah, obviously, of course, that has to be the case. But for me, I didn't really, um, I just kind of put it out of my mind, so to speak. But the next website that I pulled up looking about Francis Tumblety was on jacktheripperTour.com. I love their website. I love the YouTube channel. And I just, um, I think that they have um, just made some very good presentations about the case. Dr. Francis Tumblety, an American suspect, a very famous and more recent suspect for the mantle of having been Jack the Ripper, is the American quack doctor Francis Tumblety. I mean, imagine you pass away, and that's just how people remember you. What was your occupation? Medical quack. No, I mean, they don't... Medical quack. In 1993, crime historian Stephen Stewart, Stewart P. Evans, purchased a batch of correspondences that had belonged to the journalist George Sims. Among the papers was a letter written in 1913 by Chief Inspector John Littlechild, who at the time of the Jack the Ripper crimes had been the head of the Metropolitan Police Department. Had he heard of Dr. D? Littlechild was responding to an, an inquiry from Sims asking if he had heard of Dr. D, evidently a reference to M.J. Druitt in connection with the Whitechapel murders. Littlechild replied that he, he had never heard of a Dr. D amongst the suspects, and to his mind, very likely, they were talking about Dr. T, who was an American quack named Francis Tumblety. All right, Dr. D, I mean, that's um, a, somewhat of a big story in itself, and I did talk about this in the episode um, on Montague John Druitt. It's called Jack the Ripper, Suspect Montague John Druitt, available on this channel, and all of these suspect episodes have been put into a playlist. Montague John Druitt was um, a one of the suspects of Melville McNaughton, who wrote the McNaughton Memoranda, and he referred to him as a 41-year-old doctor who was found dead in the River Thames shortly after the Whitechapel murders ceased to take place. The problem is, though, Montague John Druitt was not a doctor. He was a barrister, and he worked at a school. Um, I mean, that seems like the part-time job, but he actually held the job at the school longer than he was a barrister. And he was not 41 years old when he died. He was 31 years old. So already there's... um this type of discrepancy. It's like somebody can find out what's going on in the news on the other side of the world, but they can't ask somebody, oh yeah, how old was the guy? And write it down. I don't mean to be hard. I mean, we all make mistakes. I make mistakes too. I shouldn't be hard on someone, but they were writing actual police documents and logs a little bit more than the, the actions of the average person. But yes, um, Dr. D may not have been Montague John Druid, it was Dr. T. According to Little Child, it was Tumble T. Arrested in connection with unnatural offenses, Dr. Francis Tumble T was charged with acts of gross indecency with a number of males on November 7th of 1888 and remanded on bail. He jumped bail and got away to Bologna. He shortly left Bologna and was never heard of afterwards. It was believed that he committed suicide, but it is certain from the time of the Ripper murders that they came to an end. A promising suspect. At first glance, Tumblety is another promising suspect. His arrest and subsequent suicide would explain the sudden cessation of the murders. However, on closer inspection, the case against him becomes incredibly flimsy. Contrary to Little Child's assertion that he was never heard of after leaving Bologna, Tumblety did, in fact, sail for New York, where the American press were soon reporting his possible involvement in the Whitechapel murders. From the moment he arrived, he was kept under surveillance by Chief Inspector Burns of the New York Police. Burns is on record saying, here, here is no proof of Tumblety's complicity in the Whitechapel murders, and the crime for which he is under bond in London is not extraditable. If I'm pronouncing that correctly, extraditable, extraditable, I mean, some, I think I heard someone say it that way once. Burns appears to have doubted Tumblety's guilt, and even, according to the New York Times, laughed at the suggestion that he was the Whitechapel murderer. So... There is a little bit of misinformation that is being shared at the time, and um, it seems like that people are inconsistent with their stories, and if they think that he committed suicide when he didn't, that just goes to show that some people may have been jumping to conclusions. And, I mean, it appears, though, that they are looking for someone who would have had medical knowledge, someone who was a criminal deviant, 
But one thing that I don't see with Dr. Francis Tumblety immediately is some type of gross hatred for women. All these other things that they're talking about is just deviant behavior that is done to take advantage of people, feel his own excitement. But there's an enormous difference between selling Indian herb powder and saying that it has some type of health property when it doesn't and mutilating a woman to death beyond recognition. And it's possible, I mean, it's possible that he was indeed Jack the Ripper. It's an unsolved case. But that's something that I don't think matches up completely. Also, with the um, aspect of how there's this whole story of how he was never heard from again, and he's actually under investigation in New York, and the police are commenting on the investigation, that um, kind of doubts the people. That, that allows me to express some doubt. Prior to the, this, I'm actually going to go over to a website, jacktheripper.org, because as I said, I wanted to read this stuff off to you guys the way that I was reading it online. One of the more talked about Jack the Ripper suspects is Dr. Francis Tumblety, whose name was suggested by Inspector Littlechild. Prior to and during the Jack the Ripper murders, Chief Inspector John Littlechild was heard of at the Metropolitan Police's Special Irish Branch, a post that was held from 1883 to 1893. Although Littlechild, as far as is currently known, had very little to do with the Jack the Ripper investigation itself, the Metropolitan Police certainly would have had a frequent con had had frequent contact with someone like Dr. Robert Anderson and Chief Inspector Swanson. George Sims writes to Little Child. In nineteen thirteen, jour journalist George Sims was sniffing around for the information on a Jack the Ripper suspect, and he duly wrote to John Littlechild asking if he had any knowledge of Dr. D being suspected of the Whitechapel murders. Sims was evidently referring to Ripper suspect Montague John Druitt and had been circulating through the police circles, who had been circulating through the police circles for the last 15 years. But Francis Tumblety will take a very strong turn because as you, I mean, some people can put two and two together. He's not going to be called Jack the Ripper. He's going to be called Quack the Ripper because he was a medical quack. I mean, I swear, if people are just getting off too much on that. It's like, oh, we have the opportunity to call somebody a medical quack. Well, quack, quack, quack the Ripper. I mean, like, well, where's all this stuff? <laughs> yeah, okay, we get it. We get it already. I mean, now, friend, now back to uh, the article here. From the moment Francis Tumblety arrived in New York, the New York Police Department also took an interest in him, and Tumblety was kept under surveillance by the New York police. So that goes against the theories that uh, some people have put forward that he com committed suicide. Collected medical specimens. A claim often made to back up Tumblety's possible involvement in the Jack the Ripper murders is that he is known to have collected medical specimens, including uteri. And this is um, irrelevant because Jack the Ripper removed the uterus or cut out cut people in a way that suggested he was aiming for the uterus and multiple victims. There is scant evidence to suggest that there ever was any collection of medical specimens, including uteri, specifically uteri, by Dr. Francis Tumblety. The allegation that he did this was made by Colonel C.S. Dunham to the Williamsport Sunday Grit, in which he mentioned that being a guest at dinner, which he had witnessed Francis Tumblety fiercely denounce all women, especially fallen women. Well, there's the hatred of women thing that we were uh, just discussing, so, I mean, okay, fair enough. Dunham went on to mention that Tumblety had taken his guests to his office where he showed them a dozen or more jars containing the uteri of every class of woman. I mean, it's something like, now wait a second, I know this is a larger-than-life story. Do you think that really happened? I mean, did that really happen? Because sometimes you just have to wonder if some people are misrepresenting the details in these stories because they are just getting carried away or they're getting lost in their imagination or some way, somehow, it's like the game of telephone or Chinese whispers, things get misrepresented. But as previously stated, though, there is a book that is out about... Jack the Ripper and Francis Tumblety called Jack the Ripper First American Serial Killer by Stuart Evans and Paul Ganey. There's a very short description of it on Amazon.com, and it states, examines the people, places, and theories, and the mystery of Jack the Ripper, and presents newly discovered information, and evaluates conflicting theories. That really doesn't share a lot, so I would like to read the uh, editorial review that has been shared of this book. The murder and mutilation of at least five prostitutes in the Whitechapel District of London in the fall of 1888 continues to fascinate students of true crime, largely because the perpetrator, Jack the Ripper, was never caught. The slayings have promoted dozens of books and more than a hundred identities for the killer have been suggested. The British authors, Evans, is a police officer and Ganey is a constabulary secretary. 
Here they argued that the killer was an American quack doctor named Francis Tumblety, who at the time was suspected by Scotland Yard. Tumblety was a peddler of fake nostrums and had had earlier been temporarily charged with complicity in the assassination of Abraham Lincoln. At the time of the Ripper murders, Tumblety was living in London and was out on bail for other charges. He fled England and made his way back to the United States of America, where he died in 1903. Definitely didn't commit suicide in 1888, but we already uh, covered that. Evans and Ganey make a case as tenuous as most. Theirs is based on contemporary letters written by the head of Scotland Yard's special branch, John Littlechild, who suspected Tumblety. Their book will interest only the most dedicated ripperologist who may find merit in the grisly photos. Well, I mean, finding merit in the grisly photos. I did some, I will say, uh, a direct response to that. However, I do want to point out that you guys may have noticed that I do this Ripper Wednesday segment, but I've actually tried my best not to share the grisly photos of the murder victims. And even when I did the very first episode on Jack the Ripper for, uh, well, in the uh, newer era, it was really the second episode, I did one on the episode of Liz Stride, and I made sure not to show anything that was very graphic or that was showing any type of uh, mutilation or disfiguration. I actually covered it up with um, some black imagery because I just didn't want to share that out there. Finding merit in this, of course, we look at the photos because they're relevant to the crime story. We look at the photos because they're relevant to the investigation, but I do not want to promote them. I mean, they're already available online, and I just um, think that it is something that um, is not uh, necessary for this discussion here on YouTube, being clear about that. I would like to address the more important um, issue of that editorial review, and that is that they're talking about how Inspector John Littlechild has Francis Tumblety as a suspect. How many times have you heard that in this episode already? But think about what I just said about the episode I did on Montague John Druitt, who was promoting him, Melville McNaughton, and how else do some of these other suspects come into play? Because one person is zoning in on them, and there's usually one story of a suspicious nature that people are examining, and then that just becomes the keystone to all of these true crime theories connecting somebody to the Jack the Ripper case. And also, it's not only about the identity of the Ripper, because I also talked about how Inspector Dew thought that Emma Smith was a victim of Jack the Ripper, something that I absolutely disagree with. And looking at how one person has this idea, and it becomes the foundation of other true crime series. Well, one of the inspectors thought that Emma Smith was a victim of Jack the Ripper. The uh, She's actually credited as being the first Whitechapel victim. And, you know, rest in peace to her, she didn't deserve to be murdered. I personally believe that Emma Smith was murdered by one of the London street gangs, and she even reported that there were multiple attackers before she passed away. But just because one person thinks something, that is actually a very weak piece of evidence, because all of these people are in contradiction. I mean, all of these people are not in agreement, are they? Well, you know, someone thinks it's Montague John Druitt. Someone else thinks that it was Francis Tumblety. And now, as we said, in the um, current day and age, people are looking more at Charles Lechmere. But in the past, they definitely, definitely looked at Aaron Kosminski. I was watching um, this one YouTube short that talked about how, oh yeah, there's this new suspect out there named Aaron Kosminski, and he may have been Jack the Ripper. I mean, Kosminski has been a suspect for more than a century, and it's actually possible that, um, I mean, maybe he was indeed the Ripper. He's a stronger suspect than some out there, and yes, he's a stronger suspect than Francis Tumblety because that just fits into the profile of someone being a mentally deranged individual whose mental state is deteriorating in some way, somehow. He was just able to um, either get over it after the murder of Mary Kelly or he was confined in some way and wasn't able to commit the crimes and he was committed to an asylum in 1891. Maybe he continued to commit crimes and he actually did murder people like Rose Milet and Francis Coles. I'm saying if because I don't believe that, that that's actually the case. And I'm also not convinced that Aaron Kosminski was Jack the Ripper. He is just a suspect that is definitely not new. And this might sound like a little bit far out, but I wanted to save this stuff for the end because, believe it or not, one of the strongest suspects that I have looked into doing this Ripper Wednesday segment is actually Joseph Barnett. And some people might hate hearing that. Joseph Barnett was someone who lived in the same building as Mary Kelly, and some places he's even referred to as a roommate. And 
Mary Kelly was the final victim of Jack the Ripper, and I was at the 30th of October of 1888. They even got into an argument where she was reported to um, have been throwing things at him, and that's in the weeks prior to her murder. Now, don't quote me on that date, actually. I'm having some second thoughts about that. But the point is that, yes, they did get into an argument, first-hand connection to the victim. But the problem is, though, lots of these witnesses had a first-hand connection to the victim. And um, say, say, for example, somebody like Isaac Kosabrodsky had a connection to the crime scene after the murder of Liz Stride. Charles Lechmere has a connection to the crime scene after the murder of Polly Nichols. So, again, th those things are all in contradiction. How could all of these people be Jack the Ripper? And the short answer is they're not. Instead, what it is is that some people might zone in on a particular incident like that, and they would just try and build a theory around that. Well, this is how the theory works with Joseph Barnett, that, okay, it was all about Mary Kelly. She was the final victim. He's murdering these other women because of a way to get to her. Or he wants to scare her out of um, being a lady of the night, and he and when she doesn't do it, then he murders her himself, and then that puts an end to everything. And not only that, he also matched up with a lot of the psychological factors that were discussed in the case. The age, being um, the resident of London for almost his entire life, someone who regularly worked with knives in his profession, and he worked in a fish market, and... Okay, now was he Jack the Ripper? I mean, the honest answer is I don't know. Probably not. And one thing, though, that I find so frustrating in my own readings on Jack the Ripper is that so many of these people are dismissed because, well, the authorities looked into them and they determined that they were not Jack the Ripper, therefore it's the end of the investigation. Francis Tumblety would be an example of that. No, he's not Jack the Ripper. Joseph Barnett, no, he's not Jack the Ripper. Even another suspect like Louis Deems, who would also talk to the police and no one's suspecting anything, therefore they are not Jack the Ripper. Well, I mean, we're making the assumption that the police got everything right all the time, that the authorities got everything right all the time. From face value, no, they didn't. They didn't catch the killer. They definitely did some things wrong there. But I just wanted to share this little rant because... I thought that there was something promising and overlooked about Joseph Barnett as a suspect, but he really didn't become a suspect until, you know, the 1970s. No, that's not fair. That's not fair. He was interrogated after the murder of Mary Kelly, and then the authorities um, did not want to investigate further. But then you would say it was resurfaced in the 1970s. I mean, I mean, I could be completely wrong about all of those observations, and if you want to tell me why I'm wrong, please write your ideas in the comment section down below. And I just want to share one final thing with you guys, that there is another book out called Jack the Ripper, Suspect Dr. Francis Tumblety. It's written by Michael L. Hawley, and the very short uh, description of that one is, Jack the Ripper, Suspect Dr. Francis Tumblety highlights the most groundbreaking discoveries concerning Scotland Yard's top Jack the Ripper suspects in 1888 in the Whitechapel murder investigation. Dr. Francis Tumulty, among the discoveries, is over 700 pages of never-before-seen sworn testimonies revealing that there is not only a picture of an antisocial narcissist with a single-minded lifelong drive for exploitation, but also damning evidence that he may indeed be the Whitechapel fiend. Okay, all right, all right, great way to just put everything together for the final line. How, how, how would you describe Francis Tumulty after, living, after listening to this episode, after listening to everything that you've heard? An antisocial narcissist with a single-minded lifelong drive for exploitation. Yes, yes. I mean, that's what somebody is. Um, that's what somebody is doing when they're selling these quack cures and they're selling pimple remover. That's probably just water and sugar or something like that. I'm guessing. I'm guessing. I didn't go back in time and do any type of uh, hydrological examinations of his water-based formula, but. I mean, he's referred to as a quack, most likely for a strong reason. But yes, narcissistic. Yes, he's self-serving. But one thing I don't see is how you get from that level of crime to being some type of twisted, mutilating, murderous individual stalking the back alleys of Whitechapel. It's possible, but lots of these other suspects that we've discussed here are possible. 
So if you want to challenge me on any of that, I would love to, put your, I'd love to hear your ideas. You can put them in the comments section down below. Overall, I'm kind of putting Francis Tumblety on perhaps the lower end of the likelihood of being Jack the Ripper, and instead it seems like they latched onto a very flamboyant and outrageous criminal, and the connections were established, not to mention with the fact that there was confusion about him being a suspect in the first place when someone was actually talking about Montague John Druitt. Lower on the suspect ratings, but... Still, very, very, very strong true crime stories. Very um, engaging true crime stories associated with this case all the same. Okay, so please put your comments down below. Anybody can write the show at blackboxonlineradio at AOL.com. You can also get me on Facebook. My personal Facebook is in the description box. And there is always blackboxned88 over on Instagram. And I will see you there for the bonus podcast. Until next time.